hey, we're going 250 miles an hour in the Autobahn, but how are you? I'm not looking at the road. Yeah. Everyone goes to see fast. It honestly is a nonstop thrill ride and a true summer blockbuster. We didn't hold back as you're going to see. It's been 20 years, 20, almost like almost a quarter of a, of a century. Tears are going to be shed. You know, we'd already be there if Roman wasn't driving four knocks on wheels. You see me shining, baby. We're locked inside. That's a trap. That's a bomb. All right, dorks, what are we blowing up? What? The Vatican? Wow, but you guys are going to hell. He destroyed the Vatican, so he might be going to hell, but here he is now on Entertainment Weekly's binge of Fast and Furious. Louis, welcome to the family. <laughs> Thank you. Did I, I, I? No, I think the Vatican does okay. It's fine. You know, Rome, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> the Vatican's yeah. still standing, though. All right. At least there's something left because not much, I don't think, but something. I have a question for you, Chanel. Were you sitting next to Derek? Like, oh how, yeah. <laughs> how annoying is it when he watches? Uh, no, we're we're on the same. How much level. elbow? Like <laughs> elbow yeah. you were, like, yeah. Well, we're so excited to dive into this film. I mean, when we're talking, I kind of was struggling where to start it. It diving in to uh, spoilers with you. Like, what's the number one thing now that people have seen the movie? That, that you're looking forward to actually be able to talk about now? Frankly, that there's a, it's a cliffhanger. That's part one of a, you know, two-parter. And, and that really is the road to the end. And we didn't hold back, as <laughs> you're going to see. It's been 20 years, 20, almost like, almost a quarter of a, of a century. They have done so much for so many people and and also I fought so many enemies that now people are coming back after them. And yeah, the, they are going to have to pay the heaviest price, you know, just the, the heftiest price. So, so tears are going to be shed. <laughs> <laughs> you have said elsewhere like you love to come up with like new camera moves or like unique equipment to use and obviously these films are huge was there something in fast x that you were really excited to just pull off with all of the actors and the crew um, and that came out just as exciting as you were sort of envisioning it i like to do that but only if it serves the story so ultimately i had to find the right moments to do that what i was most excited about when coming to fast and coming back to cars i've shot many car movies and and car chases was to shoot them differently and shoot them in the fast and, Fur fast and furious way so go back to kind of like the essence of what fast has done in the past but also going like b bigger and and stronger and also f real we just invented cameras and equipment that could go and take the actors where the action was and take the actors into the action and experience, come in and out of cars and and for real. No use of CG, no fake cars, everything is for real. And we just match the shots and do amazing stuff. So really there's some there's some really fun stuff that, that we all came up with and got us very excited. The minute that hatch opens on that submarine, I literally out loud in the screening room said, oh my God, just because I knew who it had to be. So Giselle's officially back. Like, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Just kind of take us inside the decision to, to bring her back and then figuring out the best way to do that. Giselle, come on. It's like, you know, she, she broke my heart when, you know, just that slow-mo, amazing slow-mo shot when she's just falls away just i mean that that sh that was one of the most ha heartbreaking moments in the whole franchise just to have this moment and very subtle it's a very simple subtle moment a gift that that gal gave us and and i'm excited i'm so excited then we do know a character that it seems like it really was his big final moment as we know that Jacob comes back and then makes this huge sacrifice to help Dom and to save little B. Um, how, how did that decision come about? Why is he sort of the first to go? What made that feel right when you were like with developing the script and editing it? And then of course, having to shoot all of that. For me, it was the full arc. It, it started with a conversation I had with John where I, I told him, how excited I was to meet him, how excited I was about his character in the franchise, but also 
meeting him and realizing he's the kindest man that ever lived and just just an all around ray of uh, sunshine like he's just it makes people happy i was like what if we sort of like really leaned into this relationship with little b and this like uncle who never f- like experienced love or, or, or hasn't experienced love in a long time and then that comes through his nephew and just like the the awkwardness that turns into love and everything and just that moment where accepts the 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 responsibility of being a part of you know an uncle part of this family and the love is felt for little b and little b being danger and realizing that the only way dom can get to little b is if you know he sacrifices himself john loved this idea but loved it like I was terrified. I was just waiting for that moment where you know he was going to literally give me a John Cena move, and you know, and it was like <laughs> literally that day that I pitched him that when he was like in the midst of the fight, like full, like full of adrenaline, like fifty people shooting people and everything. He was like he had three guns in his hands, and I was like, okay, John, uh, let me pitch you a scene. Uh, and then pause. He looks at me and he goes, you know, with the, his John Cena movie star smile, like. Love it. I, I, I trust that this is going to be an incredible moment, and you know, it truly is because he gave me everything. It was very emotional that day because he was like, you know, saying goodbye to a character that a, a short run in the franchise, but such an impactful run. And and John, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you met him. He's just like a soulful person. It did feel right. It felt right. It was not in the original script, but it felt right in, at you know at, at that moment. He does have the moment where he hug, where Lil B hugs him, and he you can exactly. see like that dawning on that his moment. Face. Like he had this moment where it's like he's, he feels he's like you know I I build this cave by myself. I don't experience love and everything, and then and then Lil B feels alone, and he walks up to him and just have this hug and have this kid say I love you, I love you, Uncle Jacob. It's just it's like and just John's reaction which is like a genuine reaction. Like most of acting is reacting. So I, I throw a lot of stuff at people like say this to him, say that to that, you know, and, I, and that was not planned. And it's just like, whoa, he it took him by surprise. Also Leo, uh, our young actor playing Lil B is so good and so genuine. I really loved him just to have this little kid hug you. And John felt, you know, and it was in Jacob mode. So he was like, whoa, uh, hug yeah. from a kid. Uh, I don't know how I'm feeling. And then, you know, I love you. And he just like goes and relaxes and you see him like, that was 50% Jacob, 50% John Cena. <laughs> it's so touching. And then, but my favorite moment of probably that whole sequence is then when, when Dante's reaction to, to Uncle Muscle uh, dying, first making the, the joke and then make, I'm, I mean, but like heartbreaking. Yeah, truly heartbreaking. That's a tough moment. We hesitated in moving this back and uh, move this out of the moment just to, just to feel the moment. But I needed to undercut that you want to hate him, but you want to hate him also through comedy, through moments of like, you like you go like oh it's cringy but it's like you know it's like oh it's like you love to hate him these are tough sort of like when you direct these movies you have to do like really like hairpin turns tone wise like really quickly and they're they're very they're, they're tough to but you can only accomplish them with this amazing cast it's not it's not about the words it's not about the camera move it's really about the acting today i raced to stop the blood bath. That's the problem with having such a big family. How do you choose the ones you save? Let's race! Back to Dante, like one word that kind of kept coming to mind talking about the balance between humor and also his villainy is just like a real like dastardly type of character, which, you know, fast, like a lot of the villains are really serious and really foreboding, but he gets to lean into the humor in a way that others haven't as much. And um, he like Jason Momoa does a wonderful job doing that. And I know you said that you talked like you and Vin talked every day about the characters and what those dynamics are and where they're going when you had conversations about Dante and then like the dynamic between Dom and Dante, like how, how did that get shaped? How did you figure out like how far Dante could go with how theatrical and humorous he is and, and bouncing off Dom? Like how did that come together? Vin will care about everyone, uh, comfort, feel like they're fully artistically uh, listened to before you'll think about himself. So he wanted to make sure that 
Jason was happy, comfortable, and accomplishing what he wanted to do. So at carte blanche with Vin. With Jason, he needed to realize that he could play, but also that he would be protected in the cutting room, that they would not do stuff that would be foolish or find the tone. Because the tone is, yeah, as you say, it's like dastardly. So you just have to be careful that you don't go like too crazy and not threatening enough or too threatening, not crazy enough or fake, you know, ultimately, like you have to believe in this character as, as varied he is. I love having, as I told you, like having actors react and not act. So I was like, say this to me, like, you know, call him a butthole when you throw the, you know, I was like, do this. Like I wanted to see this. I was like, oh, what will Dom Toretto do knowing that, that he can, pulverize this guy but knowing that if he does he doesn't get that there's something deeper uh afloat like there's some something that just is like there's there he needs to understand the full plan of this maniac if he just takes him out he's sm- he's too smart to be to expose himself and just want tom torero to kill him he knows that there's a you know there's a so so i was i was pushing these buttons and pushing vin's vin's buttons but also having vin tempt in you know, sort of like and go in jason's face and go yeah what's was great and it worked really well and it, they love this interaction the two of them yeah it's it's both like really funny but also like really speaks to how unsettling he is too yeah, it's yeah. like a great encapsulation of just how crazy this man is he's insane the man is, <laughs> jason is amazing because he can go like full crazy and then come back to like i love method actors but I, you know sometimes it's it's hard you know you have to sort of like find your way into you know into the tunnels to the mine here it's just like i had like this amazing performance and then and cut and then he comes back i was like so what do you think let's look at the video together let's look at the playback okay what do you, okay i can do this okay what do you think okay let's go back and so he's so comfortable so easy obviously the the end of f9 you know reunites cha and han and you have maybe like certain expectations about how that interaction is going to go and then you kind of completely flip those like you you would think that you know shaw is the one that's like oh hey sorry man and like you know han's mad but the complete opposite you know shaw's ready ready to fight kind of uh why did you like taking in that direction and was that was it basically that like flipping what people would assume uh yeah. that reunion would look like yeah you're expecting justice for hans it's going to be a nice sort of like you know a pint at the pub nah 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 it's not no it's not and then shaw is shaw and you know frankly jason statham is just in statham he's not going to be like, yeah 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 i'm like you know i'm like no nah, no nah. it, it, it you know you you come to my door there's gonna be trouble so um and then you we we go we go at it and it, it's uh great for them it's great for us the filmmakers and hopefully it's great for the fans just like it's what you've been with like that pressure cooker that's been building for many movies that's just exploding in this one daniela's character uh, yeah. Isabel was like described as being really important. And then we find out, of course, that she's Elena's sister. We're back in Rio. It could be focused mostly on what happened with uh, the villains and with Dante's character. But then we do have this really like great family connection again, too. Um, How do you guys talk about bringing that in and and why it was important to actually give that space to Elena's memory, yeah. too? No, she, 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 she's important this way, but also obviously for the obvious reasons, the Elena connection. She's also important because she brings us back to the street racing. The fact is she's a street racer. And then within this family, you know, there's the fact that Elena fell in love with, with Dom and knowing that his sister was like, you know, sort of like a burn, burgeoning uh, street racer and then dom is the god of street racing it's just as something that 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 you understand you almost like postmodern understand elena much more uh and and that made sense and then there's some surprises <laughs> We'll be looking forward to those. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the elbow. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to say one elbow moment where it's not like this crazy action scene or like something was – and not, I don't think everyone will, will spot it, but I clocked Meta Walker immediately when she showed Amazing. up on screen. And I was very excited. And like for those who don't know, like obviously that's Paul's daughter and she's remained like a close part of this family over the years. Like how did that – come about and was that a pretty emotional day on set maybe not even like sad emotions but just kind of touching and and sentimental to have her working on a fast movie so you know meadow had never acted before she's an amazing uh, model but she'd never acted before and she was very very stressed to 
I come to the, this fam this uh, franchise with this family that that mattered so much and Vin walked her down the aisle. I mean, you know, there's some, there's some, there really are, there, there's some important moments in their private lives. So to be able to bring her into this franchise and then, and then also like watch her become an actress, take after take. Like she really, at first she was like really stressed and, and also me, I'm terrible. I'm like giving her the worst, like handling props, really hot props, like mini, mini bottles and a key and pushing a, like a cart, like, like experienced actors and doing the same thing over and over again. I was like terrible. And then R.E.D. Uh, Vincent was smart. He was like, oh, let's, let's, let's sort of like tie the uh, glue them together. So they stay together. So I was like, oh yeah, great, great idea. Actually, that was our camera operator. Anyway, we, we just realized and we just like, we helped each other and that was great. And and at the end, she was like, really, she, like you felt the sense of relief. And there was like, you know, it's very, I never, I was never lucky enough to meet Paul. But since I've been on this movie, there are signs of Paul Walker everywhere. You see, and we actually refer to him directly or in very much indirectly uh, many, many times in the movie. And then like yesterday I was in our, you know, Dennis McCarthy, our car uh, uh, person, uh, his shop. And then I walk around and here's the white Supra, you know, that's right here looking, you know, watch, yeah. Paul is looking at us, like really, you feel his presence on set, like you really, you feel it. And it's really emotional. Like I got to, I got to experience, to live with Paul a little bit. He matters so much to everyone. And so, so he's missed and, and yeah, so we wanted to pay homage. Yeah, absolutely. You talked to, I've interviewed so many people over the years about him. And even if they had one scene with him, they literally unprompted just kind of talk about what a great down to earth guy he was. So it's always nice where we can get a little so real. I mean, yeah. what you can see, what I can see and analyze from the footage is that there's truth. Like, you know, Paul Walker, Brian O'Connor, there was that, that truth. Like you, you sense it, like you sense, you look, you, you see soul in his eyes. Like there's something really beautiful. So. Well, Louis, thanks again for chatting. I mean, we're, we're already going to just preemptively book you for the next movie. We got to have you back. Uh, cause then, <laughs> cause then you can't tease surprises. Cause then it's, 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 it's that's the end. You know what I mean? We have, yeah. you have to talk about it. There will be no more <laughs> teasing at that point. Right. Uh, right. Let's dig some graves. <laughs> We just ate a couple of fun muffins, and now we're going to talk some Han and Fast X. So strap in. Sung Kang, welcome back to Entertainment Weekly's Binge of the uh, Fast Saga. Thank you, Derek. It's great to be here. You're our first three-time guest. We've had a total of 11 episodes You know, do, talk about these movies, and you've managed to be on here three times. Three times a charm, I hope. The first time you came on, you were wearing an incredible hashtag Justice for Ham shirt. And I, I think we're still waiting for ours in the mail. Oh, yeah. I don't. I don't know if yeah. that was a limited really edition does. or what. It was a. It was a casting crew gift because people. I, I'd be walking down the street, and you know, you you hear people with different accents around the world in London. We were shooting the film, and you people just go, "Ham, ham, are you ham?" And you're like, "Oh, <laughs> it's justice for ham thing." So I so I created this like justice for ham and then fast and furious mime on the back. That's what it said, right? Instead of nine, it was like mime. And I told everybody on the casting crew that I got a discount on the t-shirts because they didn't um, have any ends in their printing, so everything would come out with a, a M. A N would be a M, and so everything turned into ham and mime, right? Anything with an N in it. Yeah, it was just you know fun and game. So yeah, it's a collector's item, Derek. I have to hunt these down. You guys deserve this T-shirt. If if anyone, you guys deserve it. So I might even have to give yes, you please. mine and the one that I gave my wife. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll snag it from her. You know? so. In F nine, we finally get Han back. It's this great reveal. But then we get to this movie, and suddenly it's like we have another cliffhanger. Plane goes down. We don't know. Like how. How are we supposed to deal with that for two years? It's like, is that just what we get? At this point, nothing surprises me in Fast. You know, I think everyone dies at one point in this film. If you think about it, I think even Dominic sort of died like <laughs> yeah. six dramatic deaths, real quick deaths. He's like going to the afterlife and then, then love, Letty's love brings them back, right? So <laughs> yeah. I, I think aside from family, theme is, you know, 
death and resurrection, right? So I think in a film like this, there is this argument about, oh, there's just action after action after action after action scene. And these are the moments I think, you know, you're trying to ground the movie to, and be able to connect to the audience. And the beauty of the Fast franchise and the characters is that so many people, they have grown up with us, you know? multi-decades with their father and even their grandfather. When I hear kids say, yeah, I went to see the Tokyo Drift with my grandfather. You're like, grandfather? (laughs) (laughs) It's like, how long has it been? (laughs) Jeez. It's been a long time, right? And the the fact that, Chanel, you're talking about it, it's like, hey, we have to wait two years before we see what happens. I think that's, we did our job, right? You already miss us. And obviously Han being, you know, dead again would be a a real shame for many reasons, but especially because we get Giselle back at the end of Fast X, which I'm a little worried gals like Big Return might be overlooked because there's another Big Return that somehow comes even later than that. But there were audible gasps in the theater, you know, when she popped up on screen. So like from your perspective, how exciting was it to learn that she was coming back? And then what do you think it kind of means uh, to the story and to Han to have, you know, Giselle officially revived? Well, you know, I, I, I can answer that with, you know, beginning with, um, you know, Gal going off, you know, from the Fast, you know, franchise and then becoming a force to be reckoned with herself, just the name Gal Gadot, you know, carries weight and, you know, legacy and, You know, this whole concept of Wonder Woman, that's who she is now. That's what she represents to so many people around the world. So to bring that energy and and to be able to share in her success and then her going out and becoming super successful. And then it's almost like a family member coming back and going, hey, I'm back, you know, and look what I've been doing. Right. And it's like, of course, on on a human level, on a friendship level, Gal is great friend and a great mother and a great wife and in terms of story of the fast world you know people forget that you know fast and furious has one of the longest love stories in cinema history you know the love affair you know between letty and dom what i love about fast my favorite scenes in fast 10 is that you know those intimate quiet moments with dom and letty just hanging out together cuddling like regular people it felt like hey You know, I wanted, I I knew it was real. You know, I knew there was like, there was like a true grounded relationship. And I feel like what great opportunity to, you know, bring that into Han and Giselle's like world. Like what are those quiet moments when, you know, two people are missing each other? How do they change? How do you engage in conversation? And where do you find that shorthand again? And and then you can go kick together because you are Han and so both of us have two guns what a power couple it's like we're always like killing right. people you know we're always like running and shooting and killing and jumping out of airplanes it's like it's a, you know it's like mission impossible couple it's pretty cool at the same time though when people talk about han and giselle i feel like the, the moment that comes up is that one where you're in the car and giselle's in han's lap and talking about like where you're gonna go next like people love just that moment there's like sort of a bit of stunt to it because we know they're driving but it's really just a moment between these two characters just having a conversation and i see people all the time reference it as like a really great bit of intimacy Mm. between two characters and and then you put the fast and furious magic sauce you're zipping around on the autobahn you know a couple of hundred miles (laughs) an hour while she's we're having an intimate conversation she's on my lap right it's like that makes no sense we would (laughs) die we'd crash and die i'm just like hey we're going 250 miles an hour in the Audubon, but how are you? I'm not looking at the road. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier in the film, even before we knew Giselle was coming back, like I was clocking that. I was like, Han's got something. He's got something to say. Like it either he couldn't bring himself to share it or he kept being, you know, cut off before he could share it. You know, I think of, you know, Roman crashing that car and interrupting uh, Dom and Han's conversation. Like what should we maybe read? from that, you know, earlier scene? Like, does Han know that Giselle is, is alive? That's great. That's a great question, Derek, because I think that connects to Han's kind of overall melancholy. Like, you know, he's always like in a state of, you know, contemplation and like pensiveness. And you gotta, as an actor, you gotta go, where's that coming from? Does he have hemorrhoids? Is he snacking too much? Is like, does he need more fiber in his snack choices? <laughs> you can only play like brooding for so many movies 
And so you got to find the motivation. Yeah, you know, he's constipated, so he's angry. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. In a car all day, right? So, of course, he's like pissed off. <laughs> or right. is his heart broken forever? Right? Does yeah. he blame himself that, you know, he somehow was responsible for the death of this woman that, you know, he should have been the one to sacrifice, right? So I think, you know, those big brother moments between Dom and, you know, Han, you know, they can be hopefully recycled and used as like metaphors, you know, if we can use parallels with the cars, like especially old vintage cars, when Dom is talking about carburetors and you have to listen to the motor, like, you know, back in the day and the car will tell you what it needs and what's wrong with it, right? And maybe that's how you apply it to Han's relationship is like, just listen and then you'll, it'll tell you, even the relationship will tell you what's broken and what needs fixing, what's not idling properly, right? Like where the pistons are firing wrong, or, you know, there needs to be a little fine tuning or you just got to gut the whole thing out and replace it. <laughs> Does that seem kind of, or was it part of any of the conversations you had for the decision to revive Giselle, um, so to speak, because Bass has brought back a number of people at this point, Han included. So did you get to sort of talk about what the thinking was there, even if not where it might go, but just like how it could work and make sense for the characters to get potentially this opportunity to reunite? Well, that's the great thing about Vin. You know, as a great, like, team captain, QB, if you will, you know, he tosses, like, you know, you'll have a past session and you'll just talk about ideas, so, you know, he'll basically throw you the ball and go, what do you think about this? You know, what do you think Han would do here? What do you think Roman would do here? You know, and it's an excuse to hang out, but then do some work and be creative and talk about ideas. And, you know, and then if you look at his track record, he he's always utilized social media to connect with the audience and see what is you know, like popular or in demand or what suggestions, even like, I think Dwayne Johnston, you know, like, you know, like inspiration was from, you know, uh, somebody on Facebook, I think, you know, Vin was really big on Facebook, you know, at one time. And, you know, the fact that he listens, right. And he loves, he, you know, he's a communicator and, you know, in a movie like this it takes a village, you know, it takes a city, it takes a metropolis to like create this thing. Right. So, I think the more, you know, questions and ideas that are shared, more people can contribute. And over time, you know, I think people have gotten older and, you know, there's less ego and there's just, you know, more, you know, I think, trust with one another because we've been on these movies for such a long time. People are welcome to contribute, even with the car stuff. You know, we know, like, yeah, you know, Fast has deviated away from, you know, car stuff that has been grounded in the past and so you know in this like you know the picture car guys brad and dennis mccarthy who builds the cars for the movies they're constantly asked and on the phone and on set like to go what do you think about this would this like carburetors line make sense you know what's a good metaphor for this and it was great to see these like you know tough like you know masculine like you know garage guys and car builders all oily and you know you know they eat burgers for breakfast right you know, those type of guys um you know they were very moved they were like you know love to be able to contribute no one's asked us like the, these questions in a long time right so you know it's, it's constant communication so this you know giselle return was in the zeitgeist you know it was like you know in in the conversations constantly especially because everybody loves gal you know gal coming back now as giselle is way more impactful Mm -hmm. than if it was like five years ago. You know what I mean? Right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I got to tell you, Sung, when we were, we were recently chatting, me and Chanel saw the movie for the first time. G the Giselle reveal was the end of the movie. So that's that we didn't see the other thing that was going to come um, that people are going to be talking about. And you actually inadvertently, like, you mentioned something about like a second tag. You're like, oh man, that second tag, that's, that's crazy. That's big. And I was like, my alarm bells went off. I'm like, what second tag is song talking about? And then we go to see the movie again. And obviously we get Dwayne back as Hobbs. Like for you, knowing how great Dwayne is in these movies and like what he's meant to the franchise, how psyched were you to learn that whatever issues there were, like had been worked out and that he was, you know, coming home and bringing, you know, kind of that energy, you know, as you guys kind of wrap up this series. Well, it's a great kind of reflection on life and, 
you know, how movies can maybe teach, be a teaching moment, give you opportunities to learn from your heroes. Like, oh, they squashed that. What was that about? Like, I don't, even, I don't even remember that. Like, what was the problem? They're like, they have beef. Like, I don't. Yeah, what was it over? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe somebody didn't return somebody's text or. They didn't like somebody's post on Instagram. Who knows, man? I don't know. But I'm like, oh, yeah, everything's good. Dwayne's back. Everybody watch this. And everyone's like, wow, we love you, Dwayne. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yo, man, what was the problem? You know, it's like, yeah. but then I go, was there a method to the madness, Derek? Right, Chanel? I'm like, you know, Dwayne is a wrestler. I mean, that is about dramatized hype. If you ever, mm -hmm. if you're a master of creating drama where there's none an anticipation for the final showdown, right? This worked. I was like, somebody's genius, man. It's like, <laughs> yeah. They had a beef over, I have no idea, right? Like literally, I'm like, yeah. I have to look Google, why do they not like each other? I don't yeah. know. On set, there was much dialogue and heated moments. What the hell? That's so right. general. I have that when I go to the bathroom. <laughs> it's all for the fans. And, you know, if you went to a screening, Derek, and you guys had that, like, you know, visceral, like crazy reaction. And it's a positive feeling. It's not like, ah, oh, what's this guy doing back, right? It's like, oh, we love you, Dwayne, right? So it's like, awesome. And that's something that I think somebody mentioned this. That's like, you know, Fast, the franchise has mastered this like tag. You know, now we're like at two tags per movie. <laughs> right. You know, eventually there's going to be like 80 tags. It's like <laughs> the movie's all tags. The movie's like five minutes. Everything else is like tags. <laughs> We referenced it in the intro, but the scene in that internet cafe where Pete Davidson shows up got a reaction both times that we saw it with people. What was that like filming for you guys? Like, was it just one day with him? It's so fun and it's so quick, but it's very memorable. Yeah, it's just one day, you know, you know, Pete, because he comes from comedics on stage and SNL, like improvisation, you know, his muscles are like quick. It's like, you know, dealing with like a sprinter. So that I think we had, we worked together just a day on that scene, right? So he came in and it was like, oh, it's Pete Davidson and complete pro. Like, you know, I don't know if people ever worked with Pete. It's like, you know, this guy is seasoned entertainer and disciplined and there and present and, you know, know knows how to have fun in between the cuts and he knows how to be like water and fluid and just get along with everybody. You know, it's just lovely, man. You know, you meet guys like that and you go, yeah, you know, it's like, you never judge a book by its cover, you know, and Pete is like dope. And that, that scene, and I don't know how it took us this long to say the, you know, words, you know, Deckard Shaw and Jason Statham, but you go right from that scene with Pete Davidson to picking up where we left off at the end of F9 with Han and, Han and Shaw being reunited. And I think it was on, you know, the first time you were on this podcast, when you told us the story of working together with Jason all the way back in the day on war. And, you know, you guys kind of meeting up at the airport and you getting ready to go do Tokyo Drift and him being like, oh, Fast and Furious, that, that's pretty, that's cool. Which now we know, Louis told us that him and Jason went to go see the first Fast movie together. So we know Jason was a fan at that point. Yeah, so then yeah. what was it like knowing the buildup, you know, both you guys going way back, but then also the buildup of the Han and Shaw of it all. What was it like to finally be together on set and kind of get to play out this dynamic that we've all been waiting for? Well, you know, me being in Vancouver right now, it's like you know, this like full circle moment where, you know, I'm walking down the street here in Vancouver and I remember like, you know, I'm like, yeah, that's where I, that's where I saw Jason. You know, we had dinner over there and I think he was staying here and I was staying here and remember that film war and, you know, like I could walk around the street and, you know, mind my own business. Nobody knew me from Shinola, right? And, you know, and now the day, like yesterday, you know, the you know, the, the late night screening started happening and there were people on the street saying, Hey, I just saw, I just came out of the screening, man. It's like, you know, the theater, it's the, it's the, there's an experience where the, you're the moving with the, the, with the car and there's like, you know, a more, you know, uh, like four dimensional, I guess, experience, you know, people, you know, there was a couple who stopped me and said, you just saw fast 10, man. It's like crazy. You know, it's like, great. It's just to have that like interaction. And then, think about it is like this is where I met Jason Statham and this is where we talked about me going off to do Tokyo Drift after war and he's like man that's a good franchise to be a part of right and then years later we're on set together and 
he was responsible for you know this you know this idea of Han's death, right? And now this justice, and like what is justice to be served? I have something to talk to you about. The only reason a dead guy shows up at my door. Revenge. To be able to work with a team of choreographers and stuntmen and Statham, I think a master of his craft when it comes to doing what Statham does and what's, what makes him special and, you know, beloved throughout the world. You know, it's like, what what is his, like, magic sauce? What's his craft, if you will? And then when you get to be in that intimate, like, you know, like relationship together um, and you're touching each other because you're going through choreography, it's it's something that it's, you know, you and I met, Derek, like just to go have coffee. It's not, I'm not going to like wrestle you to the ground and like <laughs> right. hold you yeah. like over and over and then flip you and get on top of you and like <laughs> hold your hand, head close to my face and I'll kill you, Derek. Like I'm <laughs> spitting in your face, spitting in my face. You're yeah. like, it's this intimate like dance you're having together, right? And then being able to, you know, apply that craft that he has into like what's the motiv motivation behind the characters and the why what is this justice for Han why is this necessary it's aside from the oh they're gonna like beat each other's it's like yeah and then what Shaw thinks that he did kill me that he went and like took somebody out so he lives with this guilt of because at the core he's a good guy I mean Dom is hanging out with his mom like <laughs> dude obviously this is like a good kid like the mother's hanging out with Tom like in Rome in a gown, like, like what the hell is this? Right. So, I mean, this dude probably has guilt. Like, I hope I didn't kill an innocent Asian man for no reason. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> so I show up and he thinks like, I'm, I'm out for physical revenge surface level, but the revenge is the, the justice is like, Hey, you are part of the family. You do merit coming to the barbecue table. Right. I think that is like, how do we bridge that gap now? It's like, you know, justice is like, you no longer have to live with this guilt because you were employed to fake my death, right? To stage it so I could go away and do something noble, like raise El, you know, my, you know, my adopted like orphan daughter, right? And, and then I think it came out great. It was like fun to go and play and be in that playground. And, you know, people get hyped up, you know, it's like, they're, you, know, you know, you played cops and robbers when you were a little kid, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's like that. Imagine now you're doing it with grownups, right? With big toys that fire real bullets and all this stuff. It's so cool. So cool. You know? Yeah. You mentioned I the, a little bit of the fan reaction and EW, we got to debut the first part of the scene between Han and Shaw. And one thing that was kind of interesting to me is people said, um, I saw some fans saying, man, it would be interesting to see them eventually team up. So do you get that sense from fans too, that maybe some of the appetite for what justice means has shifted even for the audience as well? I think everybody wants to root for Statham. I think now that bridge has been gapped, it's easy for him to go on to like a, you know, action caper with, some, you know, one of the characters, right? So um, yeah, I mean, we could, you know, we don't have to. There has to be room for, you know, Han and Giselle time too, right? So maybe, you know, it's like Han doesn't want to hang out with Shaw so much. He has other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> other people he wants to be like kicking butt with, right? So. Yeah. I will say for the record, if we met up for coffee and you, you know, started threatening to kill me and beat me up, I'd be honored. Like that that would be an honor. So start wrestling you. Come here, Derek. <laughs> yeah. I'm put you in a triangle. You had mentioned, you know, in talking about, um, you know, Shaw killing Han and allowed Han to go raise, you know, this this daughter in L. We don't get L in this film. I don't know for you was was she ever part of the plans, as far as you know, or were you surprised we didn't get more L? Or do you is, do you think that's kind of part of the long term plan to kind of you know factor her back into the story? Because obviously that was so central to you know the mystery of of where Han had been. Yes, and the answer is yes, yes. Uh, there was much dialogue and conversation that happened with Vin and the producers, right? And, you know, everybody on the team, you know, about like backstory, like, you know, Vin loves to talk about mythology and, and we sat there and we're like, where is Elle now? Is she at music school? She's off to college. And there was even a scene that was shot where I'm talking, I'm texting Elle. I'm getting off the, you know, text with her and she's having a recital at her college and I can't make it. So I was supposed Whoa. to be there. 
and then ba-boom. <laughs> <laughs> right? A teary moment, right? It's like all this stuff was like, you know, put on the table and, and then the producers are like looking at me and Van going, who's going to pay for that? You, guys are crazy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you have these like intimate moments like with uh, Tej and Roman, they had talk about friendship and they they have their, you know, moment. And then Ramsey, you know, confesses that she has this guilt. And, you know, we never got to like Han's moment, like what's going on, because that was like safe for the L thing, right? So these three characters like have this grounding kind of self-reflection time. Well, Sung, we could talk to you for hours and hours as evidenced by the fact that we've, you know, had you on three times. Um, so we'll have to have you back in two years, a long two years when Fast X part two comes back. You might have to be the co-host by, the, by that point. Yeah. You, you've been on the show so much. I we'll make you be. the third host. We'll have yeah, you interviewing fine. Tyrese or yeah. something for us. <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun with you guys. Peace by peace. What's up? Uncle Jacob? Your dad sent me. We're feeling some good vibrations, so that must mean that John Cena is back on Entertainment <laughs> Weekly's Binge of the Fast Saga. John, nice to see you again. Good to see you as well. It really is a wonderful, wonderful film. Uh, the, the cast is amazing. The action is great. The kind of seven little mini movies at once that all just crush in on an amazing crescendo at the end. The fact that you got to stick around for the whole entire movie is a great one. It's um, It honestly is a nonstop thrill ride and a true summer blockbuster. We saw like in the clips and stuff too, like you guys always seem so excited to come together. Like you mentioned, you're there are like these different pieces that have to come together and then you finally see the film. Does it feel like a party to you? Like I know it's like technically a work day as well, but does it feel no, like a party? No, it is kind of a work thing, but the work is done, you know, when you're filming and and when you when you have something you're proud of, sharing it with folks like yourselves, especially in person, that's that's a lot more fun. And I think this time the crew was having so much fun or your cast and crew was having so much fun because the movie, like I said, it's not like the family together as normal. It's a fragmented version of that where everybody goes their own way. So you do have like seven narratives at once, which is great for the audience, but it's not the usual fast filming. Like we didn't see each other a lot. So I think a lot of that was not only like it's done, we love it, but like, Hey, I didn't even see when we filmed, we got to catch up and let's go have some fun. I remember we last talked to you uh, on this show ahead of F9's release, and we tried to get you to speculate on the future of Jacob and your place in, in the Fast Universe. But, like, you opted to Thank just kind of enjoy – Yeah. <laughs> you you opted to just enjoy the moment. Like, you, you wanted yeah. to kind of wait and see what the audience reaction was. So, obviously, it must have been good, you know, since since you're back. You're in Fast X. Uh, what kind of – what were the conversations and responses like from the fans? Like, obviously, introducing Jacob was this huge kind of earth-shattering thing – uh, for the Toretto's in, in Fast and Furious. So kind of what was the feedback and kind of your conversations with fans over the last couple of years? I've been really fortunate. And and to not speculate has been wonderful because I got to come back as a cool uncle. <laughs> and if you'd asked me and like, hey, look into the crystal ball, here we are in F9, I'd have never been like, cool uncle Jacob? <laughs> yeah. singing, singing good vibration? Like, <laughs> No, no, I just never would have thought of that. That's why I don't set expectations. That's why I'm just grateful for what we got. What a good position to be in. Like it's, uh, I'm really happy with what I was able to do this movie. I was, I loved what I was able to do on the last one. I was in that moment where Dom gave a 10 second car away. And that's like a call, a huge callback. And that's a really powerful moment. So I can't be jaded after that. I can't be still trying to find my little, you know, the validation for my big brother. That, that that moment of like one, you know, long ago, somebody once gave me a 10 second car and that moment to be flipped and for me to be on that, we're cool. And that, that was a great moment to end on because it opened the door for like, well, you can kind of do anything now. And do you mind being like the cool uncle on a road trip? Mm, yeah, all right, great. How did they approach you with that aspect, that take on the character? Was it... Uh, I assume it was like as the script was written or before, did they float it to you before things got started or when did that kind of no, come about? No, you know, I always, I always ask for the material ahead of time, you know, because as a professional, I want to know what I'm reading in totality and then begin to focus on, on my little piece. It really came together meeting Leo on set, meeting Leo and Louis. Leo's a wonderful kid who's curious and excited. I can't help but like be curious and excited. So instead of being the uncle that's seen it all, and Jacob is such an isolationist being with somebody who kind of digs his vibe or gives him a hard time uh, and somebody that he can't throw through a wall. It ended up, it's just us having great rapport. So that, that was the combination that kind of happened when, when people got to meet each other. 
you, you mentioned Jacob's last scene driving off at the end of F9, which is such a great callback, like you mentioned. And whether it's pure speculation on, on your part or like info from chats you had with Justin or Louis, like where do we think Jacob was headed at the end of F9? And like what type of conversations and interactions do we think took place between him and Dom in the time between these films? Because obviously they're in a very different place when we catch up uh, with Jacob and Fast X. You know, we, we can all have our own perspective of that. But here's, here's things we know. The 10 second moment happened. Jacob was given a chance to save himself, which he did. And Jacob knows who Little B is. And on top of that, Little B knows who Jacob is. So they couldn't be meeting for the first time. And however you want to fan fiction what happened in between the two things, I think validation from my older brother and the fact that a young member of the Toretto family knows who I am by face and I know who he is by face. We have had to have interacted at some point at once, which means there's a there's some civil behavior between everybody. So before we like jump into more with Leo, who I want to talk more about and like working with him, uh, you're introduced like we we see like to that end, Jacob is called upon in this moment of need for the family, right? And so, uh, but the cool thing I realized about that as well is it's the first time that we see adult Jacob in that Toretto household, I believe. So knowing like yeah. you're a huge fan of fast before you got involved too like what was it like to step into that famous setting and then it's you know in a situation where the house gets destroyed but still and it has to be destroy surreal. it it was like <laughs> bittersweet you know I, I this is why i don't speculate but man if i go to a barbecue and, and the place gets destroyed i'm like the bad omen like this is not good it was awesome but at the same time like man i'm wrecking the place so it was a bittersweet. I feel like one of our favorite parts of F9 and then moving into this film was the Mia and Jacob relationship. Because like going into F9, everyone's like, oh my God, you know, Dom has a brother, but like Mia has just as much equity in this. And I really appreciated the way that dynamic was addressed and kind of paid off. And then obviously we get you guys tag teaming up here, you know, in that fight in the Toretto house. Like what have you liked about getting to explore those two uh, Toretto's together? That relationship is special because it's so nuanced and you can... You know, as performers, we love to dive into those small details and we make we make as much of a meal as we can out of it in our heads, but we don't expect everything we talk about to translate through screen. It just helps drive our performance and helps us find our why. The fact that Mia kept in touch with Jacob all this time and in Jacob's moment of need at the end of F9, Mia offers a helping hand and saves his life. It shows that she's capable. It shows that she's strong. It shows that she's determined all the things you, you would want in a leader, which is Dom Toretto. She has all those qualities. And she's also been extremely diplomatic. She hasn't chose sides. She's put family above all, which is also very Toretto. And then you fast forward to uh, Fast 10, where they get to fight side by side. And one of my, again, this is just our moments being performers together. When we were planning the fight, uh, the stunt coordinators were kind of apprehensive about having me get hit. And I'm like, no, this is going to be great. Not only should I get hit hard in the face, I should ask Mia if she's okay. Like, I'm coming in to save the day. And then I get throttled. And then she throttles the guy. We both throw him out. And I'm, my eggs are scrambled. She goes, are you okay? And just the two little sentences show again that she's independent capable strong always a protector always she can handle herself like she's a toretto and it's those little moments where if we can get one little beat in of like family awareness and togetherness and on top of that the little the, the mia saves the day the most unlikely of all heroes is consistently the force that keeps the family together that's beautiful and and we know from talking to a, to jordana about uh the movies that she's always game to do more action too so uh working with her like what is it like like being on set with her and getting to do that which is different from the kind of stuff that you were doing in the last movie there's a little bit of stunt work with her like helping jacob uh in the cars and things like that this is hand to hand a lot more days on <laughs> set with each other i'm assuming uh so just talk about her as a performer and getting to really you know, take what you guys have done together in a different direction too, or a more expanded Jor direction. Jor Jordan is great because she's an ori original member of the franchise, which means this is a body work for her that is 20 plus years, but she's still so giving as a performer and so welcoming as a human being. Being in an environment where you feel comfortable to be vulnerable and take risks means you might get, you have a better chance of getting a great performance. And she creates an environment where she doesn't have to. She's one of the OGs, as they say. She could be very steadfast in, in what 
you know, she's willing to do and not, but she's extremely giving. She's extremely collaborative and she makes everybody feel welcome. I love the moments I have with her because it, it that authenticity bleeds through being able to coordinate stunts. She's really good 22 years in and she's still showing up to practice a ton. So her moment can be the best that it can be like that. That shows pride in the franchise. It shows pride in the work. The originals are, are not at all fatigued. They have like a renewed sense of energy to make the beginning of the end and bring this thing home in the best possible way they can. One of my favorite moments of the film and like a real sign that we knew we were getting a different side of Jacob was the you know moment we've alluded to of you singing good vibrations uh, with, with Leo. Was that uh, was that your, your jam from back in the day or when you had to learn the words to like, was, was, do you have any input I, in uh, go with that song? That I did not have to learn the words. That's, <laughs> that's all. I think I should say that and get it out there. And that's that. You know, with Leo and discovering this new side of Jacob too, or, or like letting the audience see it, kind of what was your way into that? Like you've done a lot of comedy, you're great at it, but of course, like you want all of the jokes and stuff to kind of be specific to character. What is Jacob's sense of humor? Like how does that play? Like where did you start with it? What's the nugget? I think it's situation dependent. I think the jokes between Dom and Jacob, if there are any, are going to be a whole different palette than a curious young nine-year-old boy. You know, I love the scene in there where Jacob tries his best to give some parental guidance and then fast forward and then kind of calls his own rules back and goes, no, no, don't worry about it, man. It's, we're we're going to be all right. He is essentially the cool uncle, but that that's all because of the room I'm in and, and the people that are, that are there with me. Leo's ability to perform as little B with the energy that he brought allows me energy to play off of. So that's the only reason that that personality is crafted in that way is because that's how I am with young people. You know, I try to remain just as curious as they are and try to have answers when they have questions or at least some guidance. And uh, I want to make an environment where like, hey, you're going to be safe no matter what. Louis, when we talked to him, called out the moment of uh, of Leo hugging you, you know, once you guys arrive at the little hideout there and he sees the cannon car and, you know, says, I love you, Uncle Jacob. Louis really praised kind of, you're reacting and kind of you're acting in that moment. What was going through your head for that scene? And like, what did you think uh, was going through Jacob's mind as that kind of happens and sets up maybe what's to come? From my perspective, the best you can do as a performer is take the information you have and then try to be as authentic as possible. And what we do know about Jacob is he's a spy. He's well-versed in espionage. It's further uh, driven forward by, a, a, again, a throwaway line in the script of that and plenty of time by yourself. He has not had a lot of friendships. He has not had a lot of people care about him. I bet you can count on one hand with zero fingers how many times he's heard the words, I love you. So for him to hear that for the first time, doesn't matter who from, that's a wave of something. If for him to hear it from someone who is a family member, young people are real, real truthful and real innocent. Without any speculation on what's the subtext of this, it's pretty incredible. So I think when you just connect those simple dots, you're able to, to be authentic to the response. Cannon cars. That was awesome. Once you guys do have to get uh, the two characters you get into the cannon car, when we see it as an audience, I'm like, oh, Jacob made himself like a Batmobile type of thing. Is that what it felt being in that? That rig is incredible. How many versions of it are there? I saw five practical models. So they got five El Caminos and then made them like they were out of a Mad Max movie. I really enjoyed the way that they did it practically. All the loading mechanisms worked. All the buttons inside worked. Like the cannons could pivot and turn. Oh, wow. And that's what I love about Fast. There is a lot of imagination involved, but they always start with a practical base. You're not just completely using your imagination. They give you just enough to keep you focused and allow you to be curious. And the Canon car was awesome. I love cars. I'm a car guy. So in between takes, Leo and I are messing with the switches. And he's like, what's it? Just like in the Mustang when he just doesn't know what a cassette tape is because he shouldn't. Yeah. But like we had a bunch of fun in the Canon car and it kind of never got old filming in there because there's so many levers and switches and we did develop a good sense of team cohesion on how to work all this stuff because we had to learn how to work all this stuff. So the car was great. And that's a testament to the 
to set design and, and the property department and the transportation department because they, they care as much about it as we do. Louis told us that he presented uh, the climactic sacrifice of Jacob to you on set. And he, he worried, he, he knew he was presenting something risky and it wasn't sure how you'd take it, but that you were kind of immediately sold. What do you remember from about, about that conversation with Louis about the direction he wanted to go with Jacob here at the end? I remember him being extremely nervous <laughs> because what that signifies is something that could elicit a reaction from me. But what he failed to realize is my perspective of every opportunity is allow me to do the best I can with this opportunity. And that's it. And his idea was the best. And I'm a big believer in best idea wins. If this is, is, is all that it's going to be, I'm super grateful. And, and we're going we're gonna to do it the best way we can do it. What did you love about when you actually came to playing that out? I mean, I think Jacob's last lines are essentially like telling Dom, you know, time for me to step out from your shadow. You know, thanks for showing me the light. What jumped out to you about the way that Louis chose to have you go out? And what was it like playing that final sequence in line? From my perspective and audiences, they'll be entertained with whatever they want. They'll think whatever they want. I'm big on self-worth. You got to believe you're enough. Being in that scenario was like a, a windfall of self-worth. Doesn't matter who my big brother is. Like, and again, a little throwaway line on the plane. Like, do you know who your dad is? He casts a pretty big shadow. Call back to, it's not a throwaway. That, and that's also what I love about Fast, the intricacies of the storytelling. You can just be at the edge of your seat with the action the whole time, throw popcorn at the screen, have one hell of a ride, and it's an awesome movie to see. Or if you want to get into it, they don't waste a sentence. Everything is interconnected. Everything is a callback for something. They don't waste anything. It's our job as performers to make those connections and be like, okay, what was going through my perspective is this is a moment of self-worth and I realize I'm enough. And I also realize the value of family. And this is a decision that I'm going to make to preserve the value of family, and which is a core value of the movie. I don't like when movies tell you how to think, but when the tagline of this one is, who do you choose to save when your family's so big? I can confidently say that a core value and a through line of fast is family. Since you're mentioning the callbacks, do you have a favorite callback, whether it's from this film, even the last one, which was also like packed with references to the beginning of the franchise? Is there one that you love? I love the let's race. That's it for me. The same let's race film one. Like that's intense. To me, that's like, we're doing it. And it's followed by a street racing scene, which yeah. I'm so glad they put in there. Yes, the, the superheroes without capes, absolutely. But I love that they were able to go back in F9. They did it with like prequel recaps. I loved that they were able to go back, able to go back to film one and do it in the now and have a believable let's race. And it was great. Paul Walker's daughter, Meadow, like, you know, she had shared a bit of news about kind of revealing her cameo in Fast X, which I'll say we saw the movie before she kind of shared that. And we both got very excited when we clocked her, you know, walking by and stopping to talk to, to you and Leo. Um, what was it like just, you know, being a part of that kind of huge moment in Fast history? You know, you know, how much Paul meant to the Fast family, both the people making the films, but the audience. And you know how much Meadow means to this Fast family. So what was it like? You know, I'm sure that was a kind of an honor to kind of uh, be maybe the guide a bit to her and, uh, and share that scene with her. I think kind of is an understatement. Vin forever has the the highest perspective of it all. He sees things from a level that none of us do. And he pulled me aside and said, I'm gonna put you in a scene with Meadow. Immediately, that is not lost. To be able to be a Toretto brother and then to be able to have a moment on screen with Meadow, things are important when you make them important because it's all kind of a woozy and a wazzy out there anyway. I come from a world where you wear a black and gold leather belt and that's, that's all it really is. But we make it important so people strive to hold on to that black and leather belt or black and gold belt. This was one of those moments where as a fan of the franchise, as someone grateful to don the Toretto cross, and as someone who knows or has a, a great deep meaning or understanding of the meaning of all these moments, it, w it wasn't lost on me. It was incredible to be able to be a part of that energy. Across these two films, I mean, that might be it, actually, the scene with Meadow, but is there a moment that you think will stick with you or hold you'll hold on for a, a long time? Seeing the public enjoy the movies. That's absolutely crushes any moment that I would have on set. Tons of surreal moments for me, ones that, that I'll store. But my biggest moments are seeing the world entertained. Everyone goes to see Fast. 
grateful and blessed are words that are thrown around like and and um, but I came from one global phenomenon and was invited into another. So I've, I've been able to experience that highway twice. That is by far the best when audiences go to the theaters and, and love the ride. That seems like as good a place as any to leave it. John, we appreciate you uh, coming back on. We always love talking to you, love talking fast. And uh, you're a fan like us, so it's always good to chat with you. So we appreciate you talking a little fast, X. A great conversation, guys. Until next time.